Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here with Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pete Wright. Hi, Nikki Kinzer. Oh, <laughs> what a fantastic member pre-show chat we just had. Yes. Uh, Movies, TV, timers. I, timers. You know, I just want to say, <laughs> if you are if you are a, a member of our Discord community and, and, are, and are at the deluxe level or better and you watch the member pre-show, you would have seen me talk about this little device called the Focus Timer, which is a gift from our one of our members, uh, Steve, in the... Uh, in our community and I am so grateful for it and I just want to say it on the proper show because people won't get it go to getfocustimer.com and check it out because we're not sponsoring us it's just a cool gadget and I have been having a lot of fun timing uh, my my time blocks over the last just to, because 18 it's hours pretty. Yeah, <laughs> just because it's, it's like great pretty. I want to time it's, everything it's new it's shiny yeah. so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it just it. it reinforces the need to to just have a visual uh, sense of time passing so that I don't have yeah. to worry about the actual numbers of time, right? right? I can just nice. say, yeah, block this. Anyway, yeah. really, really great. We are talking about, oh my goodness, we're talking about the, the world as it changed around us. Why, yeah. why is it, why it didn't used to be so hard. ADHD, it didn't used to be so hard. That's the yeah. premise, and I wonder if we end up believing that at the end of this episode. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking that most people are going to say, no, it's always been this It's hard. always been but We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what we come up I, with. I actually think there's a third path that I'm going to take, <laughs> and I can't wait to run it by you. So that's what we're talking about today. Uh, before we get started, head over to TakeControlADHD.com to get to know us a little bit better. Of course, listen to the show on the website, but uh, generally subscribe to the show in your podcast app of choice. And uh, for those of you who are in Google Podcasts, we are obviously, we're not leaving Google Podcasts. Google Podcast is leaving us. Google is getting rid of Google Podcasts and all future podcasts are going to be available in YouTube Music. And our podcast is already there. So if you were a Google Podcast listener, you can go to YouTube Music on your uh, mobile device and search for uh, the ADHD podcast and you can subscribe to the show there. Um, so that's that's the big news um, that Google has once again thrown all of its cards up into the air and turned over the table and walked away. Uh, so head over to YouTube music. I honestly podcasts. didn't even know there was a Google podcast. Well, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I it wasn't. And, I, and what I have found is most people who on the news of hearing that Google is leaving the podcast business have just gone to pocket casts, which is another great podcast app. And I use it and I think others could, should give it a shot. But YouTube music, if you're uh, if, if you're want to stay inside that Google uh, music ecosystem, that's the place to get it. Uh, anyway, yeah. so that's the podcast news. Subscribe to us in a podcast app. But once you, uh, you, you know, once you do that, you should head over to our Discord community, takecontroladhd.com slash Discord, where you can chat along with other ADHD like-minded adults. And uh, if you are looking for a little bit more, this, this is the pitch. It's time for the pitch. I'm just going to call it out. The next 60 seconds is the pitch. Uh, the Take Control ADHD Patreon community is what it, it is the lifeblood of this show. We do a lot of things with Take Control ADHD, but Patreon is the thing that supports the podcast. So if you if you love the podcast, if you have been listening for a long time and it has touched you in one way or another or helped you think about ADHD and productivity and time in a new way, head over to patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast and check out the tiers that we have on offer there. Basically, uh, you know, for just a little, just a few bucks a month, for five bucks a month, I think at the deluxe level, you get access to the live streams of the show. You can jump into Discord and chat along with folks as they listen to the show. Uh, you can get, and you get to watch, you get to see us on video. And that's, uh, you know, your mileage may vary on that kind of thing. I don't know if that's I don't know if it's good to see us do this show. I don't know either, because right but, now I'm playing with my lights. Yeah, but it's just a lot and of I'm shenanigans. And I'm trying to figure out like yeah. what's going on. And it's yeah, it's antics. I, don't know. I believe the word is ant. <laughs> there are antics on video, but, but we just oh, we like appreciate you so much for supporting the ADHD podcast on Patreon, and we try to continue to give back in that channel. So uh, you know, head over there, Patreon.com/slash the ADHD podcast. You're the best. Thank you. And now, let's talk about why we're so busy all the time we're so busy all the time
the thesis here was that like do you do you remember that time back when we were younger and things were somehow better right like i like i can picture myself riding my bike down the street in my neighborhood and right. the tree the air wind was blowing through the trees and i was flying and i i you know maybe i had playing cards in the spokes of my BMX bike. I had a mongoose. And uh, maybe I could just feel the environment and everything was okay. Like everything was generally okay. And I, maybe I struggled in school, but I don't know what struggle was because I didn't have really anything to relate it to then. I was just a dumb kid living my life. And now those things feel like they weren't even th that I can't relate to those experiences anymore. Those experiences feel like the experiences of another person it, that, that I wasn't. Well, it's a younger person, right? I For mean, sure. I think that if we're looking at when we're young, of course, things are different because now we're adults and we have all this responsibility. Whereas when we're young, somebody else is responsible for right. us and they need to make sure that we're eating and <laughs> going to school and doing the things that we're supposed to be doing. So I, I, I don't think it's a very fair comparison, to be honest. It is a hard comparison, I think. Yeah. I, that's the, that is a, a real challenge. And, and I think... I, I want to talk about why it feels harder to have ADHD as an adult, largely as a perspective setting. But I feel like the there is an earlier perspective setting that we have to, to address, which is yeah. the nature of busyness writ large, like in the world, because those things, the way we interpret what, what it means to be overworked have, has also expressed itself in a new way for everyone. So um, my my sense is ADHD is competing in an unfair playing field where is. everyone is is busy uh, to the point of massive distraction. And then we also are living with ADHD on top of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think if we go back into early years, it's a different kind of problem. So it's yes. not necessarily, it, it's not a fair comparison in the sense it's just a different problem, right? Mm -hmm. So some of these things are taken care of by your caregiver, but then there's other things that are happening on the playground and in school. And you're, you know, as you get a little older, maybe in the like fourth or fifth grade, you start noticing that you're not exactly like everybody else. You're mm -hmm. not processing things as much. You don't want to sit still every, you know, for three hours, whatever. I mean, like you're going to start noticing these things. So the, the issues are, the, the problems are different. And then as young people, you can't communicate what's wrong. You don't know what's wrong and you don't know how to say it. Right. So, yeah. um, a lot of things can, can happen with that. And then, yeah. And then all of a sudden you become this adult and, and uh, you have all these responsibilities and uh, and the pressure around society and being busy and and productivity is such a big thing and time management and all of these things that are hard yeah. for ADHD. Um, and then we're getting these expectations from, you know, the, the world that's not ADHD that you should you should still be this way. You know, right. this is this is the productive life that you should have or whatever. Right, um, right. Yeah. And that we ch actually change the way we value productivity and our own expertise. And I think so. So I want to talk just just for a second about performative busyness. And some of this stems from our conversations on the Oliver Berkman stuff. Uh, Absolutely. I've been just sort of taking notes around this for a while. And the other is, you know, some of the um, just some of the pieces that he mentioned and some of the people that he, he mentioned in his works. Busyness is and and I encourage you as you listen to this to think about both your relationship to it yourself, like what it means to feel busy vis-a-vis -vis productivity, and how others relate to you when they talk about their busyness. Because I think that's a that's an indicator of culture, right? So busyness is this reflexive response when we when we're asked, "How are you?" What is the first thing you say? Right? I'm so busy. So busy. <laughs> it's such a busy time in life right now. Yeah. It's always a busy time. And it always is. Yeah. yeah. And yet, like one of the things that you and I talked about in the pre-show just a second ago was what a glorious celebration of nothing we did this weekend because it right. wasn't busy. And I, I think that's the that's the interesting note. That became the thing that was weird about that conversation is that we're yeah. not completely, uh, you know, gobsmacked with work. Um, we it, it busyness is a and overwhelm are a badge of honor 
for a lot of people Absolutely. and hustle culture is really celebrated. We feel the need to validate our busyness by providing detailed accounts of how packed our schedules are and overflowing inbox boxes. The number of times I have talked to somebody and they've turned around their phone or their iPad or something and said, look at my schedule. And it's just packed to packed, you know, with appointments and things. And that's, I, I totally get it. We, we pack mm -hmm. our schedules now. This, we display busyness as a status symbol and a form of validation from others. We, it suggests an underlying insecurity and desire for self-worth in a competitive economy. Generally, the busier we appear, the busier people are around us, maybe the more successful they are. I was going to say the more money you think you're making because you're so money. busy. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, technology enables us to be always on, which feeds the busyness obsession. I have this tool that can, you know, I don't know, file the taxes of the entire subcontinent of Madagascar in, <laughs> in you know, seconds. I, I should be doing it, right? Like I should be uh, doing all this stuff. Um, slowing down is avoided out of fear of falling behind or being seen as unproductive. Right. I so see we, this a lot. Yeah. Especially like on the weekends, not wanting to have any time of uh, or any space to just do nothing because there's always something to do. And so there's this guilt of, oh, I shouldn't be watching these movies. I should be doing this and this and this. And yeah, yeah. right, right. And it, it disconnects us from from meaning and happiness. Right. It disconnects oh, us sure. from the abilities. We forget how to process slowness. And at, yeah. to our own own detriment, it becomes addictive. Busyness isn't is becomes this sort of maladaptive social behavior, and it it escalates as people take on more and more obligations. Our own innate need to people please fuels the culture of busyness around right. us. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, it distracts from difficult emotions and provides a false sense of control. Right. It distracts you because if you're always busy doing something or thinking about something that comes next, you're never stopping to think about who you are in the space uh, around mm -hmm. you and and the, your life experience. It's, it's like we forget to process that um, it, we get have, we're guilty. We, we get super oh, guilty yeah. about not doing anything uh, that becomes culturally ingrained. Mm -hmm. I don't feel right when I'm not moving. I don't know how mm -hmm. to not set my alarm in the morning. Or mm -hmm. worse, I don't need to set my alarm anymore because I wake up at 4.30 automatically. I don't know how to get a good night's sleep anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to demonstrate constant progress, even if the tasks I'm working on are unimportant. Uh, right. I'm always moving a ball down a field somewhere, somewhere. <laughs> somehow <laughs> yeah. um, prioritize. Uh, you know, we prioritize reactive tasks over substantive work that take real focus. Right. So here we are. We're just saying we're, we're not addressing a work box. We're addressing the inbox and we're reacting yeah. to the inbox. Um, our idleness and reflection are seen as unproductive instead of necessary. And busyness signals that you are essential, productive and not lazy. And this is a, the, the locksmith story from Dan Ariely, I think, is a really good one. And it, it really hits home for me. He tells a story of a locksmith that he hired to open his door when he was locked out of his house. And so the locksmith, he, he says when he was just starting out, he was inexperienced. It would take him a long time, right, like 25 minutes to pick a lock. And he often end up breaking the lock along the way and having it to having to charge for it to be replaced customers were super happy to pay this $120 service fee plus the $25 for a new lock and then would tip him today that same locksmith is more skilled. It takes him one to two minutes to open a lock, but customers no longer tip him and complain about the $120 service fee, even though he provides a much faster service and rarely damages locks anymore. So the way Ariely talks about it is that this illustrates how we judge value based on effort rather than outcome. So we tend to reward incompetence and unnecessary work because we can see the the striving and the struggle. It's like evident there's sweat on the brow and that's worth something to us monetarily. Even though customers get quicker, superior service, they focus on the brief time it takes versus the former lengthy process. And that is a cognitive bias. It shapes our perceptions of busyness. We impress others by emphasizing effort over results. Wow, that's really interesting. It is interesting. I run into this all the time. 
That's right. just everybody. So now we get to talk about why it feels so much harder to have ADHD as an adult in an environment of performative busyness. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely think that it comes from a lot of the expectations that people put upon themselves. And what's so interesting is we talk about they, and I always wonder who they are. <laughs> like, who are they? Like, who are the people that you feel you need to live up to or that you need to please? Um, because I, I would say that in my um, work, that is, that's it, is the expectations are so high. And there's this feeling that everything needs to be done. Everything is urgent. It's all behind. And then there's this overwhelm of what to do because everything needs to be done. And so when the question is asked, you know, well, what are the priorities? What's most important? It's really hard to choose because yeah. everything feels important. And so I think we have to like really dissect like where are these expectations coming from yeah. and where are the shoulds coming from and what does it matter if it, i mean if nothing's getting done right now right let's just put it out on the table nothing's getting done right now anyway mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what can you do different or what is there to be done differently and maybe it's all about mindset has nothing to do with the tasks mm -hmm. But can you approach it in a different way to make it a little bit easier to not compare yourself to other people? What do you want? Yeah. What well, do you want, you know, to get done or what's important to you? Yeah. And I think what's interesting about that, like, and if we go back to how we opened this conversation about what it felt like, you know, riding down the bike in the neighborhood with the wind in our hair, um, you know, we forget that we were gifted with the structures of parents and systems and schools to help us get the things done that we needed to do, right? Right. And, and we may have been doing them, you know, poorly. We may have struggled to do them. Our sense mm -hmm. memory may be that I wasn't very good at homework, but none of that has, you know, can, can, is rationalized without the experience of having some sort of structure that was applied upon us, right? Absolutely. And we consider as we step out into the world, our relationship with the world around us and what it, and, and this culture of busyness, we have to face that without any implied structure, Right. We without uh -huh. the you know, we have to build that ourselves. We have to use the tools. We have to, you know, use the worksheets. We have to use the systems in order to give ourselves the same schedule that we inherited by just existing when we were younger. And that is so hard. And I don't think we talk about that out loud enough that, uh, you know, we're our memory of what it was like having ADHD as a kid we forget the lens through which we viewed ADHD as a kid. And there are all kinds of ways we saw ADHD, but we had a structure, right? Right, and right. It could, have, it could have also meant bullying. It could have meant, you know, social anxiety. It could have meant imposter syndrome, performance anxiety, all of those different kinds of things that mm -hmm. we felt and lived with. But we also had a structure. There were people trying to help us frame our days. Mm -hmm. you know, so if you ones. have ADHD and you don't know you have ADHD and now you're thrown in this world because after high school, there is no more structure, right? Yeah. No one is saying you have to go to school. No one's saying you have to go to work. Like you're on your own, right? Mm -hmm. Like you've got to figure this out. And if you don't have a support of a support system, it, you're going to feel lost. And that's probably why too, when we look at statistics and we look at like, you know, what happens with untreated ADHD, there's more people in jail, there's more divorces, there's more um, job uh, hopping. I mean, all of these things increase when the ADHD is not being treated. And so um, it, it is, I mean, I think that we, we don't set up our young adults very well. Mm -hmm with with ADHD and I don't even know if we set them up very well without it but it's a little easier for them to figure it out well for so, sure yeah it's, it's easier for them to figure it out it's also easier like I, I don't remember 
my relationship with memory when I was a yeah. kid. But I know that my relationship with memory was such that I would forget enough of the bad experiences over time that I could appear functionally more resilient, I think, even than yeah. I am as an adult. I, yeah. I think the more the the more I age, the more I bounce up against um uh, those the experience well, of and that probably is because of the lack of experience we don't know yeah. anything different so right right like you had mentioned yeah. in earlier you were saying something about like i don't know anything different and um I, I remember asking a question to discord and they were saying i don't know what normal like i don't know what that normal is because this yeah. is what i've always felt and so it's um it, it's just an interesting point to think that y you know when you don't have that experience and you don't have all of those negative experiences, you can be more resilient because there's nothing holding you back saying, you know, remember when this happened before and you know, like, it, so it is interesting that the experience piece. Yeah. Definitely yeah. makes you a, a more RSD. I think so. <laughs> it, 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 there's it more triggers. More RSD because we know what RSD is. <laughs> is right. right. Yeah. Like, we've and we've experienced you know, it. you've felt it, you've you've experienced yeah. it, you've lived it. And uh and those expectations are still really um really high. Yeah. And and it's hard too because um you know, I know we don't all have we don't have the uh ability to just create the you know the schedule that's going to work for us like there's there's still structure that we have to live within yeah. and but how do you do that in a way where your brain thinks a little bit differently and not put the high expectations on yourself and still be you with ADHD how do you live in the world and still have ADHD and not have it be against you yes yes i mean that's functionally it and so it gets us to this sort of last point of you know how what do you do practically every day so that you can exist in a world that is increasingly busy around us and values time and our input to it differently, maybe more aggressively than it did when we were younger, let's just say. How do you create a space to reclaim some of that peace and still exist in the world, you know? competitively let's say so going back to the four thousand weeks which has got to be probably one of my favorite books of all time uh you have to make choices we have to start getting comfortable with making choices and deciding what is most important to us for us mm -hmm. and not for anybody else and you know we need to support our, there's a lot about supporting your ADHD, but it's also, you know, making the choice of doing this just for you and your family and the values that you have. So it's not just, it's not a selfish, I, I don't mean it to be like a self serving selfish thing mm -hmm. in a bad way. Um, but with that being said, if you can walk into the world and say, okay, this is what, this is how I process. This is how I like to work. Now I can set up schedules and I can set up systems and I can practice these things or I can do these things that I want to do in the world on my terms. This is what I need to do to support myself. Doesn't matter that Pete over there in Portland does it something different. This is what I need. And mm -hmm. then it's, it's conditioning the employers and family members and spouses of, you know, this is, this is what I need right. to have a good, you know, relationship in our home. I don't do well with bills. I need you to take that on and have that like conversation of this is going to be better for both of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Like, and, and, uh, and at work, you know, this is how I work best. If you can give me the freedom to start work when I want to start it, you'll get the eight hours in, in the day. But I need to have that flexibility of getting of doing it the way that I need to do it. Mm -hmm. And maybe that means taking like a break in the middle of the day to go work out because right. you need that exercise. You need that dopamine. I think we need to spend more time focusing on what supports your ADHD and then how does that support you in life and taking a moment to slow down and 
to be okay with doing nothing and that that's just as important when you're intentionally planning it is just as important to plan your uh exercise and your personal time and your reading time and the time that you want to connect with others do those things first and let the other things fall into place you know th- it gets to this conversation that we had last week or the week before on the the values calendar and time shielding right. that we are i i think the maybe one of the best sort of expressions of navigating ADHD in the busyness culture is understanding ourselves as humans as hybrids right when it comes mm-hmm. to time that when you when you stop and and think about the things that are important to you to your values calendar to saying on the calendar I want to protect time to work out and to do these things you're you're not protecting a specific 30 minute workout you're protecting and shielding this hour every day to do something that is not specifically related to your to your passion. Uh, another one of the things that we've talked about before, m- maybe not extensively enough as performative busyness is the trend of taking your your hobbies and turning them into side hustles, right? Mm-hmm. I, I once loved taking pictures and then before I knew it, I was a practicing photographer, right? right. You know, for money. and And just how... It, 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 in some cases, that might be the right career progression for you. And in other cases, that might just be a side effect of performative busyness because everyone's doing something like this, taking a side hustle and the and anything that you have a, a natural sort of affinity for or ability to create becomes something that everyone assumes you should be making money at. And mm. and that is so dangerous. That is so dangerous, I, I think, for our brains, because it gives you no space to be thoughtful about creating for the good of yourself. You're always then creating for the good of others. And once you go down that road. Especially in art. Yeah. Yeah. It's Especially really with hard. Art. Yeah. So, well, and what I love about your photography example is that we have a um, a member of Patreon who takes pictures, photos of um like flies and bees and bugs and they get really yeah and oh my god it's so beautiful it's so beautiful and so i think it's like the joy of when you take this beautiful picture and you see all the details like you would be doing that without making money like it's just a joyful thing to do and uh, you know you're appreciating nature and we need to do more of that and not yeah. feel guilty about it. I mean, that's right. the that's the thing is life is not just a to do list and and checking things off. And that's the the busyness busyness part of it should be like a happy busyness. Like, yeah, I've got work I'm doing, but I'm also busy with like enjoying life. Yeah. You know, I'm going on vacations. I'm spending time with my family. I, you know, get to hang out with my cat. Like, whatever. <laughs> You know, the, a great you expression know. of that. We There is another conversation happening elsewhere in Discord about how long it takes us to wind down into vacation mode. And mm-hmm. I think that is a, a really great indication of how well we're doing this. For th- those of us where it takes days to turn off, and then we feel like, for me, the anxiety comes back up very early, like in the vacation about returning to work. Yeah. That, I feel like, is a sign that, perhaps we're dealing with the discomfort of our own in, inner thoughts, right? Like it's hard to slow down, like working out, you know, you're sore when you start working out for the first time. It is a, it is a practice of discomfort to actually get good at, at physical fitness, just like it is emotional fitness. And mm-hmm. I think we have to realize that slowing down uh, from the busyness culture is an act of discomfort right? It's an Mm -hmm. act of saying out loud to the world, I'm not doing this thing that you want me to do right now because it's not good for me. And it's also an act of telling yourself, I'm going to be comfortable with a little bit of more emptiness in my life. I'm going to be comfortable walking with my dog and listening to the sound of the world around me rather than constantly having an audiobook or a podcast playing in my head. Because there's no other opportunity for reflection. And, and I think that is, is something we're seeing more and more of. Experts who are coming out and saying reflection, inner reflection, is one of the things that is most important for us when we're dealing with silencing the noise of busyness culture. And for ADHD, I think that is absolutely 
manifest tenfold. Yeah. And, you know, vacations are are interesting. And this is just me on my own personal opinion. I think the best vacations are two weeks. I really yeah. do. And if you can, if you can do that, if you can negotiate, if you get two weeks of vacation, ask your employer if you can take them back to back. It's one time a year, you can prepare for it. So you're covered and all of that. But there's something magical about two weeks. I think that because when it's only a week, there's always this anxiety that this week is going by really fast because they always do. They go by really fast. And then it's Wednesday. And there's just this anxiety around what you're getting back to, right? Like there's just this constant, like, even if you're in the best place in the world, it's still this, it still lives there. At least it does with me because yeah, of my anxious personality anyway. But um, two weeks is ideal because you get the, you get that, but at the beginning, you really are still in this mindset of, oh, but I still have like a week and a half. I'm good. Yeah. Like I still have plenty of time. I still have so many things I can do and choices. And do I want to read today or do I want to do a puzzle today? Like I, you know, and not have that, like that stress. And so I, I really personally like two weeks and then I'm lucky enough. And I know Pete, you feel this way too. Towards the end of the two weeks, I'm ready to come back. Yeah. And I am fortunate that I love what I do, that I am ready to like, I'm refreshed and I am ready to like, go for it. Yeah. I, you know, and I think I'm I'm glad you called that out because so much of this, when you and I are talking about it, comes from a place of, of noted privilege. Like we Absolutely. work for ourselves. Yeah. We have a lot of flexibility. We don't have a boss looking, looking down on us and tracking what we do right. anymore. Like we've, we've kind of moved through our career path to have to have something, you know, just where we are in our lives. But I just want to acknowledge that it's not just you, you don't just have to take a two week vacation to find your space. Yeah, uh, you can do it every day. You can do it by doing, you know, taking protecting more time when you get out of bed, not to doom scroll, you know, social media, yeah. but to do a crossword. Like, I know that sounds so, no. you know, maybe so ridiculous, but, you know, do a crossword or do a connections. I, man, I'm addicted to those connections quizzes. I do a set of games every morning mm-hmm. without looking at the news that has just been delightful, right? Like mm-hmm. it's just a, it's just a way to change the brain before the shower um, that allows me to rec- reclaim a little bit of that. When I do want to be doing something, I, I want to wake up and like be thinking. Um, So I like that. I've also, you know, one of the things that we, I don't do often because of the nature of my work, I'm constantly in a place where I need to be in front of a microphone. But the last couple of months, we've been working on this other project and I've been doing more and more work in the evenings at, you know, our local coffee shop. Getting outside of my Mm -hmm. space changes the way I interact with the work that I'm doing. And, uh, And that's another way to just sort of reclaim some, some peace from, you know, stale normalcy or busyness culture. Well, and what a great thing for your ADHD too, right? Yeah. Because now you're being stimulated in a way that you, you kind of got used to at being at home. So yeah. now there's something different. And I think that that's a, that's a good point is like, how do you, how do you change it up just a little bit? Yeah you know, to make it more engaging. I'm I'm obviously a massive podcast hound. And uh, one of the things that I have to do uh, often is unsubscribe from the news podcasts that I subscribe to because I'll, yeah. I'll unsubscribe and then something will happen. I'll be like, oh, I'm a little out of touch. I guess I'll subscribe to just this one. And then before long, I have 10 different news podcasts that I subscribe to all covering different sort of editorial angles. And I realize, oh, right. I need to do a reset again. And honestly, yeah. I'm okay with the ebb and flow of engaging in news culture, but generally I'm better and at greater peace when I when I turn it off for a while. Yeah. Right. Oh, I, think I, agree. That's, it, I think that's the thing. Like so much of, of what we hear is just stop doing this one thing altogether and you'll be you'll be better. And that's not really it. The Mm-mm. the answer is awareness, right? Mm-hmm. Awareness of how you are engaging with the world. And I think mm-hmm. that's, you know, maybe that's another gift of age. I'm sure if you go back 10 years on this podcast, I'd have a lot you know stronger opinions about <laughs> binary thinking. Uh, yeah. But uh, I think I'm I think I'm more chill now as a result. I think so too. Yeah. So, uh, well, we're what old. else? You got, what you can got we anything say? else? We're old. <laughs> <laughs> old and happy. Nope. 
No, I'm uh, good. Yeah, thank you. Interesting. Everyone for listening. Uh, this, yeah. Yeah, this was a. This is a. Um, I think this is a really important subject, and I. Mm-hmm. I hope you know. I hope it gives some sort of reflection on on what is you know, how we relate to the busyness culture and our performative busyness and, and, and know that ADHD, you you can take two different tacks with ADHD. One of them is seeing the world around you hyper performative and believing that you have to compete at that level in order to, to find happiness and peace and belonging. And the other is recognizing that they're playing a game that you were never designed to play and that you need to play your own. And yes. that's okay. It's really okay. So. I love it. Great way to end. Thank right. you. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to the show. As always, we appreciate your time and your attention. Don't forget, if you have something to contribute to this conversation, we're heading over to the Show Talk channel and our Discord server. And you can join us right there by becoming a supporting member at the deluxe level or better. Again, thank you so much to our Uh, current and hopefully future patrons, patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. On behalf of Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you right back here next week on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. (music) 